Hello, I'm back. I'm functioning. <laughs> I think a lot of people saw my video last week where I, um, we had an experience here, right? You read about California, have you? Uh, even if you're not from California and <laughs> we have the fires and we had uh, a few days there where there was heat and fire and one special day, which was last Monday when it was 102 in my neighborhood in Oakland. And you couldn't open the windows because the pollution was so bad. And so there you were. We don't, we don't have air conditioning here generally in houses. So I'm sure a lot more people have air conditioning now. <laughs> hey, how you doing? Are you from California? Now, who have we got on with me today? Um, and um, just say hi. If you like or not if you don't like. Um, today's topic is solitude and dharma practice. And um, I don't have all the notes of organization that I usually have. You know, I'm usually, uh, I've got eight pages of notes for every, every hour that we spend together. But I think this is a topic that I know well. Hey, Rob, thanks for saying hi. I'm glad you're here. Um, nice to quote unquote see you. <laughs> Appreciate you dropping in. So you're in the same situation I'm in with the Rob's from Sacramento, and it's the same, maybe a little worse in terms of smog right today. So um, I, I'm familiar with this topic because um, let me back up a little bit. I had this image like from when I was before I was a Buddhist, and even before I read Yeshe Sogyal's autobiography, which was the gateway for me into Tibetan Buddhism. Mother of knowledge. I had sort of an image of a woman in a cave. Not a guy in a cave. How did I even know there were women in caves up there? Sitting on, you know, inside of a mountain, in the little lip of the cave, meditating. And I thought that was like the bravest, coolest thing I'd ever heard of. Does that, does that sound brave to you? <laughs> it was really, um, I don't know. I had this image. Maybe it's a, I can't really say it's a past life image because it's kind of cartoonish, you know. The actual caves actually generally are, are um, tricked out with a floor and a, some walls and stuff to make them more habitable. He's not just sitting in a cave like that. But when I read them, went and read Yeshe Sogyal's um, biography, you know, the great mother of Tibetan Buddhism, uh, Guru Rinpoche's perfect disciple with um, photographic memory and um, incredible fortitude and accomplishment. Um, it was so awesome. Rob, have you read Yeshe Sogyal's autobiography, any of the three versions? There's there's three versions of the same one, Sky Dancer, Keith Downman, Mother of Knowledge from the Dharma Publishing People. And I don't remember the name of the Padmakar Translation Group version. I can picture it, but I'm not happy it wouldn't be behind me. But um, Then there was another one, someone discovered in a library in the Potal Palace in Lhasa. I mean, like 10 years ago or something. And then my Dharma sister, Chini Droma, translated it. So um, I had that image. Now, this is sort of the quintessential cave dwelling Practitioner was, now you think I'm going to pull out Milarepa's story. I'm not going to. Milarepa's story, sad to say, or wonderful to say, is probably a work of, largely a work of fiction from someone after his time who wanted to write an inspirational tale. That's so say these scholars anyway today. Boo. So, <laughs> but what well, but is more more recent back in the 18th century was this fellow 
The Life of Shabkar. Have, have you read this one? Thick, huh? This is... I, I haven't read it in a few years, and I need to start doing it over again. I think it's my favorite book in the whole world. You can probably tell because it's beat up, and I think this is my second copy of this. I think I had another one I lent out to someone disappeared. So whoever you are, bring it back. And um, now it's okay. I keep it if you like it. So, um, Shabkar wandered. He was from Lamatarchan Pache's home country of Repkong. And um, you can visit a throne that he used to teach on. It's still there, sitting out in the middle of the woods. Um, you'll see pictures of it. You can probably find pictures of it on the internet. Shabkar was kind of half monk, half nakpa, or non monastic yogi. Um, he didn't talk about having girlfriends, but um, he was quite a renunciate. He called himself a renunciate, which generally means a monk, but he left, he grew his hair out in the style of, a, of the non-monastic practitioners. So he couldn't be labeled one way or another, which is kind of cool. And he would, he got his training from his wonderful Lama, and then he went and traveled all over from one retreat spot to the next, doing years and years, you know, basically um, all of his life up to the point that this was written. I don't know how old he was. He was pretty old when he wrote up this point. And then there was a, there's a subsequent volume that has not been translated and published. It's apparently hasn't, because it was, he was not wandering around at that point. It's not as interesting to people. Or maybe it has more songs of uh, realization, which I adore, but very few people apparently really like. I'm pulling around to the spot where I that I marked this morning. Are we gonna did I really take it out? It seems like I did. I marked all these spots many long ago. So I guess maybe it's behind here instead of in front here. So the coolest part hmm. Yeah, I pulled the note out. It's typical. So, <laughs> the coolest part is um, he traveled alone. He sometimes would stay where there were other yogis, um, but very much in remote places, um, often in caves. And it pretty soon he got a following for two reasons. One, people who wanted to be his students. And second was homeless people who um, were hungry and he would instead of keeping like it was tr it's traditional to make big offerings to llamas great llamas as they come through and you, fo you throw a big feast and give money and um, he was one of these guys who um, didn't keep the money he just he would give he would the big feast would be thrown and Instead of just like the farmers and townspeople and monks and nuns that might be in attendance, he would invite in all the homeless people. Is that wonderful or what? And <laughs> they, and they um, so they followed him, like in dozens and dozens, maybe hundreds would follow him then wherever he went. <laughs> and um, so that's an interesting, relevant tale for today. But um, generally, then he, I think sometimes he'd send everybody away and he'd go off on his own more. Um, the most beautiful t chapter is a chapter at the heart of the lake. This is tra translated by Matthew Ricard. A monk. Um, and this is um, Lake Hokonor which you can see on a map, the Blue Lake or King High Lake, um, up in what's now King High Province. I may be saying it wrong um, since the Chinese take over. And um, in the middle of this huge, huge lake, inland lake, is an island. And you can zoom in on that on Google Maps, which I've done many a time. And there's a, nowadays there's a nature preserve on one part. There's some kind of secret military installation on one part. I think there's probably a road around the whole lake at this point. It's huge. 
Mm -hmm. In the middle of the lake, there's an island with a hill on it. In the side of the hill, there were caves. And in the caves, there were yogis. So Shapkar, in the winter, the lake would be frozen and you walk out. And then when the lake melts, it's all over for the year. So you, you, go, you go into the nearby tiny villages and for provisions um, during the winter months. And then you'd stay out there. And there were several wonderful yogis there. And Shapkar prided himself on being Rime or non um, Word finding is a little hard this week. <laughs> non sectarian. So he had a good local lama there he, who he viewed as, yeah, I think he was a peer and also one of his lamas. And he learned a wonderful Gulukpa material. And he learned uh, and did practices from many schools of Buddhism. But it's, I, I found one place in him here where he said, I'm a Nyingmapa. So he's mainly a Nyingma practitioner, if you know the schools of Tibetan Buddhism. So as he, one interesting thing I was noticing today is that he was he sang his teachings, and sometimes the characters in his songs would be the bird he'd met that day or the bee, and the bee would have a voice and it would make a commentary. In particular, if he had something biting to say, Shabkar, about misconduct in his environment, he'd have you know like the bird be the one who um, told everybody off very sarcastically. So if you like sarcasm and yogi, yogis, this is a good book for you. And if you like solitude, this is a good book for you because it's like the t what could be more romantic than on an island in the middle of a lake the size of like almost the size of one of the Great Lakes, not quite, you know, in the middle of the winter, in the middle of not just central Tibet, but way northern Tibet. <laughs> wow. So um, he and he was always joyful. At least his songs are joyful. So he said, and when he would do these long goodbyes, he'd meet all these people and they'd say, so what are you doing? He'd, he'd break into song about going, I'm going out to Soning Island, the heart of the lake, and uh, I'm going to do me some retreat. And he'd do it all in verse and song. Isn't that wonderful? So here's how he felt about solitude. Yes, I'm getting to the point. <laughs> uh, okay, just before we parted, as he's leaving, uh, in response to their request that I sing something, I sang this joyful song. Now that I have won this human body so hard to obtain and have met the authentic guru, absorbing myself in one-pointed practice, I, the renunciate yogin, am happy. Having sung this sweet song of joy, I will go to the excellent place of solitude. If anyone here does as I do, the sun of happiness will surely dawn. So many verses, and we'll go down to another one here. I have no enemy to subdue. I have no family to protect. Free from bias attachment towards friends and family, Free from aversion towards strangers, I, the renunciate yogin, am happy. I have a few essential notes to remember. I have no stacks of books. Undistracted from my practice, I, the renunciate yogin, am happy. These days in the land of snows, there is no one as happy as I am. Having sung this sweet song of joy, I will go to the excellent place of solitude. If anyone here does as I do, the sun of happiness will surely dawn. This is the singer of this song is one called Sokdruk Rangdro, which is Shapkar's official name. Isn't that beautiful? One time when I was in a retreat myself, I spent I did like a I did a series of retreats. I don't recommend going into to re, getting enthusiastic, reading these lives of the saints, and then having never done any retreat, jumping into a really long retreat alone. Generally, retreat alone is better after you've done group retreats for quite a while. And then, but I didn't really abide 100% by that rule. I started with like a weekend retreat, then a one-week retreat, and a three-week retreat. 
And then I did a, I don't know, three month retreat. And in that three month retreat, I must have had a lot of shamatha. My f shamatha, you know, sometimes you'll get meditation experiences from this calm, abiding, resting in the room. And in that, all kinds of creativity will come out. So, um, one of my friends um, told me that he was did a just shamatha, like without any words, silent sitting style shamatha, for a month, and or maybe three months. And he had all these, like classical music, compositions, without trying, they just arose in his mind so he could hear orchestra, he could hear like a classical music orchestra playing these beautiful songs. God, that never happened to me. <laughs> Nothing like that. But sometimes I would, throughout my life, I'll dream songs. And one time I, I was just looking today at he missed his father, his father, his spiritual father, um, who we call the Dharma King, who was did have some political responsibilities as well as Dharma responsibilities. And with such yearning, you know, like to be back with him, but it may have been away on Sony Island for a long time, years, I think, if I remember right. And he said, uh, Thinking again and again, I remember my old father, the Dharma king, his queen, and his court. Remembering my father, the Dharma king, my heart breaks with longing. I cannot bear it. My breath catches in my throat. I cannot speak. Tears uncontrollable stream from my eyes. And Vashayana, Buddhism, or Tibetan Buddhism, kind of devotional crying. And really having a lot of feeling about your teacher is considered to be a really good sign. Not only a sign, but something that um, fosters excellent, uh, catapults your practice forward. Most of us Americans, I dare say, do not, it doesn't come easily to this kind of upwelling. And so I've heard others be like, I remember. Tai Situ Rinpoche of the Kagi school, hearing him say, you shouldn't get too carried away with emotionality. <laughs> On the other hand, don't, you know, all this emoting and crying, well, you know, that's not really where it's at either. So anyway, whatever spontaneously happens, so don't force anything. But I'm not like that. I'm not a guru. So, um, I'm talking about the wonderful masters of the lineages and people who really um, can show you the nature of your mind. When I, oh yeah, so when I was, um, there's a line in another poem where I shut the, the poem. It's like, uh, you know, I just read it. And I got this, I had this melody in my mind about it in the middle of this retreat. It was like, mm, here I, mm, here on this island, I remember the father. Da 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 da. And I could hear like this wonderful. It was a tenor or a what? But a, a like a musical theater kind of. You know, I'm standing on a darkened stage, the spotlight comes on the yogi. At that time, I thought it would be the most wonderful thing in the world to make a musical about the life of Shabkar. And uh, I didn't. But um, and it's probably the melody of some famous m musical, tell me. So So that kind of thing will happen in, in, in solo retreat. See, I came around the point again. Solitude, where you really, um, the, the concentration aspect or relaxation coupled with concentration or focus lack of distraction from others can really um, you can have these kind of um, nice encouraging heartwarming experiences that really uh, encourage you to keep going with your practice and so um, that's 
that's wonderful. I, I asked a few of my friends and what they thought, and I made a whole slideshow. And what I was looking at the screen during our pre-show pre, uh, setup at was like, I couldn't, it's, there's a new version of my software, and I can't quite make my face pop up in the slideshow. You know the way when it's really cool and my face pops up in a little circle down the side. For some reason, it's not popping. But I do have a slideshow for you, so we're just going to take up the whole screen with a slideshow, I think in a little bit and what it, that's about is I asked my um, Burma sisters and brothers about what they thought about solitude when they thought about solitude in practice what were their ex actual experiences because um, yeah you can get that experience of a lot of focus and magic kind of not in the like nothing really tremendous happens in my retreats but you know that kind of juicy atmosphere from being left alone and you also can slack off in your practice and not miss sessions and so forth you can get distracted especially today with the internet around your llamas will you need to have some supervision from a llama um, for the stuff that comes up in retreat, so you need to have a phone, then when you have a phone. So that's distract. So distraction is easier. That's one downside. Um, no, it's not easier. It's always, it's, it's hard. Distraction is pervasive. No matter what you do, even if you leave all your books behind, like Shabkar did, which is very traditional. Can you, you know, in, in my three-year retreat, we were like, suddenly the the words on the back of the shampoo bottles were really really interesting after a while you know even if you had brought books with you when they were in your cabin which i did i wasn't really reading books that wasn't my distraction particularly so um but what is it There's no witness there. So, you know, so you think just this one time I can do such and such, right? Whereas in a group retreat, somebody's clanging a bell every so often when you're supposed to be in your cabin practicing. And as you'll see from some of the notes I'm going to bring up in my slideshow from my friends, it has, for some people, most people really need that. And then once you've established that habit, it's easier to be diligent in a personal retreat. So, um, nonetheless, I did a, a pretty damn di diligent <laughs> early retreats before my three-year retreat. But I did, yeah, I, I progressed. Well, if you're ever thinking about that, Rob, I'd suggest building it up gradually. And... Um, it's the other thing that happens loneliness happens and so there's a whole process of letting go of whatever it is you want from human beings that um, I don't know when it was I think I've said this before but bear saying at some point I remember walking up the steps to my cabin and three-year retreat which is not a totally alone but it's um, lonely in a way it's more alone because you're thrown in with people um you probably don't have much in common with you know maybe you probably haven't come some in common with one or two of them but you know how it is to be alone in a group is in many ways harder than to be alone alone but anyway i remember going to my cabin and walking up the stairs and it just hit me it was Done. I was really alone there. I don't know how to describe it. Like I'd spent my entire life uh, in relationships, always sleeping with someone. Of course, that's not true. Of course, there were gaps, but during that gap, you can be damn sure I was looking. And not necessarily, of course, there's, you know, uh, everybody misses sex in retreat. Almost everybody. There may be some asexual person there who who does not but it's rare but uh, for me more human touch and companionship 
it was um, I was very very attached to it but um, at some point I really accepted it, the situation and uh, in that as some of my people in my come forthcoming slideshow will tell you it's a whole nother level of practice because you know they all say you're coming into this life alone you're going to leave this life alone and um, for us Buddhists that's only this life is only one a very tiny part of a whole story of unfolding um, but I kind of think if we're going to try to have some accomplishment in the bardo following this life then I don't know how to how we can do that if we're all focused on other you know I mean fortunately it's well known in hospice care the very last stage of your life is um, there's a withdrawing of your attention so it actually becomes easier in some ways although pain is an issue to concentrate um, you're no longer so outgoing, always focused on everybody around you in the room. Now, we have seen that. Room. I've seen patients die, you know, retired nurse. So I've just been thinking about, um, you know, some people, I think there's a developmental piece missing where, and maybe this is a culturally biased perspective that I have, but um, this individuation process of being able to spend time alone like even the idea of sitting on a cushion, Rob, I know you don't have this because you're a practitioner, but um, I don't want to make fun of anybody. I'm not making this lightly at all. I mean, there's a, there's a, uh, because of circumstances in somebody's family background and so forth and going right into a marriage, having kids really quick, there's never any chance to become comfortable with being um, alone. So, actually just sitting down on a cushion in another room and not always being interacting with people um, can feel unsafe. Walking in the woods can feel unsafe. Um, even when, you know, there is no danger and you don't have a history of abuse or being robbed or anything like that. So uh, I've been thinking about that and wondering what could um, help people in their develop their early meditation practice. So. Folks, if you're watching this after the fact, a lot of people watch my videos. Um, most people watch my videos after the fact. You can leave me a comment below and ask me if this is an issue for you where you're just having the, the obstacle for meditation for you is being alone. Because I'm talking about all this stuff for us people who are pretty, we're in, introverts, comfortable alone, even like being alone. And, but then there's other all kinds of people, so let's mention that. So I just want to throw this slideshow up there. I'm unfortunately I have I'm not able to make my picture pop up in the little circle in the right hand side where I made such a nice space. <laughs> but that's okay. You can hear my voice uh, still. Let me know, Rob, if it pops off. Um. So. someone saying you know, she felt that pro solitude provides the best opportunity to finally take the rap for your own mind you know taking the rap is American slang for um, taking responsibility and um, this is a really important point in Buddhism it's a kind of maturity to not always be pointing the finger at other people so forth being alone, whether simply alone in your home for extended periods or in an isolated place, allows one to more clearly see the mind. This can be both challenging and fruitful. Yeah, definitely. You see, it's it's really hard, to, again, pointing the finger at somebody else all day. You never point the finger back at you and say this is coming from your mind. And so um, it's very important to spend as much you know not as much time alone as you can but some time alone in your in uh, in your meditation practice and in your life so that you can see what's going on in your mind 
This guy said, presently in lockdown, doing full days of accumulations, I certainly find having someone nearby around is, is helpful, simply for the idea of having a physical witness. I certainly fidget less. So there's an example about having a witness makes you um, want to be on good behavior. You know, we, we need all the help we can get. Oh, and doing, doing accumulations, if some people may not be familiar with that, that's like um, saying a lot of mantras, saying a lot of prayers, saying, making a lot of prostrations, like doing meritorious and, uh, and um, concentration building exercises to accumulate merit and wisdom. I think we must embrace loneliness. We must let ourselves be overcome with loneliness and vulnerability. Make ourselves totally available to loneliness until our ego is swallowed up in the vastness of it. And we know beyond any shadow of a doubt that we are not alone. And we never have been alone and never will be. What do you think the gender was of this person who left this nut. Very insightful, isn't it? This is the example like I'm talking about walking up the steps of my retreat cabin. Um, recognizing this, you know, swallowed up in the vastness of it. That's exactly right. To really accept 100%. You're alone, alone, alone. Because that's very powerful and for us older people it's quite quite common uh, that we are alone as in terms of not having a partner as I don't do not have a partner and um, I've gotten comfortable with it and not only comfortable but now I can every now and then raise my head up and see the big picture and remember that being in relationships was really hard in other ways and being outside of a relationship and not have anybody to snuggle with is um, is hard in certain ways and life is suffering so said the Buddha seeking conventional solitude will not avail you of authentic solitude real solitude is the freedom of retirement from duality oh this is Saraha I thought this is pretty high pollutant Resign the creation of self-identity. Let go of reference points. Quit the domain of differentiation between this and that, here and there, arriving and departing, confidence and confusion. Only then will you discover the non-dual state. So this is the great Indian master, Saraha, who is saying, um, yeah, sure, you can be in solitude and not have to be in solitude. You can be alone. And not really, well, it's still in your mind, you're playing out reference points of this and that, he and her, he and me, and there and near and far, and uh, playing, uh, at, you know, building up your self identity. Quit it all, let it go, and that's what really solitude means. Going back to our regular people. I always thought when I didn't have family distractions or work commitments, I just wanted to do practice. So when lockdown happened, I thought that this would be the perfect time to practice all day. But that's not what arose. I had to wrestle with powerful feelings of abandonment and loneliness lodged in my nervous system from a very young age. I began to dive into all the online practices offered at this time. That is what helped me clear the kleshas in my body so I could rest in my own solitary practice. Yeah, so different strokes for different folks, obviously, in different times of our lives. I found groups, uh, I found drama talks during this pandemic have been most helpful for me in studying, strangely, which is not usually my dominant mode, but I've been studying, studying, studying Dharma. And I too have this, uh, I was um, a um, lonely little girl. Um, and so I certainly have that experience and I've certainly worked on it. You work on it in practice, 
and I work on it in therapy. I'm, I'm a pro-therapy person, and uh, it's very important to undo these um, sort of traumas. Trauma might be too strong a word sometimes, but there's other words that might be better. So yeah, it's being, it would be horrifying to suddenly be thrown in. In this situation, you have a lot of unprocessed stuff with abandonment issues, you know, to be thrown into the current pandemic and et cetera, et cetera, this year. That sounds really hard. It was hard enough for me. And um, I thought I was going to want to do strict retreat, and I started in on that for, oh, I don't know, a few days, <laughs> maybe. And then communication turned out to be key, you know, peer communication, communication with mamas, um, knowing what's going on in the world. Uh, for me, I'm shut up in, a, in a, my house yard, but um, I want to be in touch. I'm very comfortable with being alone and isolated. Doing regular scheduled Dharma practice sessions in my isolations? LOL, not going to happen. I'm profoundly grateful to my Vajra sisters and brothers who were in retreat with me. When the bell rang to start the session, seeing them all off to their cabins and hearing the Dhammaras play and chanting begin inspired and coerced me to do the same. I never would have made it without them. So there's an honest story, you know, like some people really need external structure. And we are, as the Dalai Lama often reminds us, social animals. So there's that. This is one of a man who was in the three retreat group before me. And the one before that was so beautifully written was a woman. Um, I just thought it would, it, this was such a feminine language, languaging. It's interesting. Solitude in nature is best for me, although I've been dissuaded by Dharma siblings and teachers, but I find it the best. It's good to have sky, silence, utter solitude. A caveat. I really like Druk Chen, and I really like Chan, Chan or Zen retreats. There's a group energy there that I like. Also, I also don't mind having people over for practice. That doesn't break the solitude somehow. A Druk Chen is a great, incredible, large ceremony with with um, dozens to hundreds of people. Um, that takes place in a big Dharma center or monastery, and you um, are doing, it's accumulating merit and mantras and lots of um, offerings and meritorious deeds um, around the clock, 24-7. You, you get a break, but every shift is covered around the block in practice. Really recommend it. And then... Um, at least once, see how you like it. And then um, I've never been on a Zen retreat. Um, so I don't know about that one. I, I, my, my body hurts just thinking about having to sit as much as they <laughs> sit <laughs> these days. I guess my age is showing. I find a richness and aliveness that permeates my solitude when I do practice alone. With others, I obtain a different richness. I don't feel it is as deep unless the Vajra master is someone like Jujum Yangtze Rinpoche, let's see. Um, the current Jujum Rinpoche. When alone, as you said, I feel more connected to the elements. The COVID lockdown has not made me crazy or depressed as I, as I have heard about others. It's fodder for practice in my humble opinion. I, this elements thing, that was a surprise to me. I really feel connected to not just nature, but there's a kind of a feeling of wind. There's an experience of air. There's an experience of earth. Mostly I get air experiences. <laughs> but if you have water in your environment, you're tuned in in a really long solar retreat. Most I've done is a year. Um, all of that comes to the foreground um, in a really lush, wonderful way. So accompany along with your loneliness is the howl of the wind. Very wonderful and horrible. 
I spent many months and a few years in semi-isolation retreats. With the passing of time, I come to con the conclusion that it's the only way to practice effectively. When one can override the strong impulses for social interaction, solitude can become a very good teacher. Also, it becomes very boring to play games with oneself. Last time we practiced together, I taught a practice, a version of a practice um, that is done in sync with the three seed syllables, om, on, hum, that represent enlightened body, speech, and mind. I'm kind of, um, because they involve um, Tibetan Sanskrit letters, typically, I'm kind of simplifying to just use the sounds and then kind of spheres of colored light. So let me, let me go through that again. It's a kind of, since um, we have a short time of to practice together, um, this is a perfect way to very quickly fall into a state of relaxation. There's a lot of ways of doing this practice. For instance, this is the way I learned from one of my lamas. Okay. So, so out in the space in front of you, there's a white sphere, we're going to say. And it, it comes towards you as you say Om. Om. Very famous Sanskrit um, syllable. But in this case, you're saying it on your in breath. Isn't that strange? We mostly don't say things on our in breath, do we? Let's do it. And it comes in, it's not so, so important exactly where it, and it comes down into your center. Something like that. And then there's a little pause, and then you say, you, you see a red sphere here at your throat. You can say that as best you can. And so we did go through, like, how can you say it when you don't have breath? And so you're kind of holding your breath, but you do a little ah. So I'm going to go back from the om and then ah. Ah. Like that. Seeing that red sphere here. And then down here you see a blue sphere at your heart center. Right down there. And it comes up and out and goes out into space of where the Om came from. And it, with that you make the sound Om. So let's do it all together. It just goes Om, Ah, Om. So, oh, yeah, I'm going to sit up straight, right? Oh. Oh. 
So what I'm doing now, after the Om Ma Hum just really relaxes, it brings in, you know, between visualizing, sounding, breathing slowly, and experiencing in your body. You have your body, mind, all involved. The energy is equated with speech, so uh, the whole thing is a unity. I think it's a wonderful practice. And we do that about 21 times, typically, by you can do it any number. And then I just look like I'm looking back at my own presence, my own empty presence, translucent and free, without concepts, and just resting there. So I'm going to do three Oma Hongs and then we'll just rest there a little bit, okay? Okay, so I'm going to bring up a little dedication of merit today. What am I going to do with this recording? Am I going to... Hmm, oh, it's not there. I think I've tried that before. I think I've lost that dedication of merit. Okay, we'll just say it. Go back with a better camera. By this merit may all obtain omniscience, may it defeat the enemy wrongdoing from the stormy waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death, from the ocean of samsara, may all free all beings. Really, may we free all beings. So, um, going back, you know, when you're doing that breathing exercise, yes, it is. It comes at the beginning of the Monchen Nintik Mindra, of course, in some traditions, and different lamas do it different ways. And I thought it might be useful here. So, something about your breath that I sort of take for granted because I've been a singer and practitioner and so forth um, is that you're you're not just bringing this uh, breath into your chest, but you're bringing it kind of metaphorically down into your abdomen and kind of you're locking a little bit at your at your xiphoid process. Okay. Don't prolong this a whole lot. So when you go in, with the ah, uh, you're kind of um, imagining your belly is like a balloon. So it's really your diaphragm dropping down, right? Keeping your diaphragm down, and not um, letting that, uh, not letting it come out until you're ready to gently let go and bring it out in front. So, um,
Well, I guess that's it for today. A little bit spaced out, a little bit. I hope you enjoyed my little stories about Shepka and Solitude. And um, next week I'm going to be on the road. My little laptop computer doesn't um, doesn't doesn't have capability to do YouTube live. And my cell phone, uh, you know, the more people. Um, if I get a thousand uh, followers, please uh, subscribe. Anybody who's watching this, subscribe and watch. A certain number of hours, and I get a thousand followers. Um, then I can use a cell phone signal to make uh, YouTube live videos, and that makes life much simpler for on the road stuff. So, um, everybody, sign up. <laughs> and I'll see you, it's Rob, I'll see you in the future. Um, nice to. No, you're here. Uh, let's I'll get together in a couple of weeks. But I, I'll put a video up of some kind on Monday of next week. Uh, Non-live video. Bye.